The meeting of the Board of Education is now called to order. Please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone to our meeting tonight, and we'll get started by approving our agenda. There's a motion on page two. Are there any changes to the agenda? No, there are not. Okay, does somebody provide a motion? Mr. President, I move that the Board of Education approve the agenda as printed. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Thank you very much. All in favor of... Uh, Proceeding with the agenda as printed, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion is passed and we'll move along with our agenda as we had planned and we'll start as we always do with the superintendent's report. Thank you, Randy. Um, I'm going to go a little bit out of sequence here and uh, what we have in, in order. And I, I first want to uh, kind of start on a, a bit of a somber note. I hate to start meetings this way, but uh, we have lost. Uh, over the past six weeks or so, a couple members of our uh, of our staff, um, and I and I want to just draw your attention to the two uh, that I mentioned. One is uh, uh, the first is Alan or Al Riddle. Um He was a custodian at Angling Road Elementary School, uh, hired with us since uh, 2017. Uh, he passed away on April 1st. Uh, he came to us, uh, as I said, in 2017 after retiring from a 31-year career at Delphi and prior to that serving in the Marine Corps from 1970 to 1976. So after, uh, after his retirement, he decided he wanted to do something different and, and then came to us and served in that capacity. Uh, he was a 1970 graduate of, of General Motors Institute and uh, a staunch MSU supporter. Um, actually a season ticket holder to their football games for, for the last couple of decades. So he was always a joy to be around. Um, he loved being around students. Uh, you could see him most every morning out at the buses, uh, greeting students as they were coming off the buses. Uh, so um, Al will be very much missed by staff there, uh, as well as, uh, as others throughout the district and leaves a void. Services for him were held on April 5th at Trinity Lutheran Church in Papa, where he was also an elder, an usher, and a member of the choir. So um, he died at the age of 76 and had been married for 57 years uh, to his high school sweetheart, Kathleen. So um, we wish his family the best as they continue on without him. Uh, and then also uh, the loss of Dan Vamastic on February 27th was, uh, was really devastating to all of us. Um, Dan uh, was not only a, a tech director in his years with us, but, uh, but much more than that to many of us. He was hired in 2021 as the Assessment and Student Information Systems Coordinator, if that's a title. Um, instrumental in setting up a parental viewer for student uh, attendance initially, uh, and then uh, a couple years later was elevated uh, to the uh, Director of Technology Services for the district. So he held that position until his passing, but he was a lot more than just the position and the title that he held. Uh, he provided technical guidance during school renovations and construction for all those years. He helped in, uh, build and design the district's technology infrastructure. Uh, he oversaw district media services. Um, he took the lead in during the whole redistricting process that the district went through when Whaley Elementary School was taken offline and 12th Street was, was open. And he was intimately involved with the Ported Central Yearbook staff. So he contributed a lot there, but outside of the workplace, he was an avid photographer. If you've ever seen any of his uh, photography work, uh, you'd be amazed at the quality and the and imagination that came from that man. Uh, and he was also uh, an incredible father to his two children, Will and Emma, and will be, he'll be missed by many in the district. Uh, 
a celebration of Dan's life will take place on Saturday, April 27th. And that'll happen from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Zhang Portage Community Senior Center. Uh, there'll be a brief uh, ceremony of remembrance will take place at uh, 2.30 that afternoon. And I know that there are more memorial contributions that are being accepted for the uh, first day shoe fund. So uh, that's, that's where he had a passionate interest in that. And the initial work will, will go to Woodland Elementary School uh, where his kids attended school there. So if we could just take like just a moment of silence to, uh, to remember these two outstanding individuals and what they brought to Portage Public Schools. Thank you for that. And then moving to a higher note, we did avert another situation due to the actions of one of our staff members. And uh, to tell you a little bit more about that situation, I've got Eric Albertus here, high school principal at Portage Central Elementary School who will recognize John. Or Portage Central High School, sorry. I saw, I saw Sarah out of the corner of my eye and I know there's Portage Central Elementary kids here, so sorry. <laughs> No, not even for a minute. Uh, yeah. um, you don't need me to tell you that we work with incredible teachers. Um, and you also don't need me to tell you that we work with incredible colleagues who are not teachers, who without them, the school wouldn't go. Um, we're blessed to work with folks like Pat Flynn, uh, who's a retired band teacher here, uh, John Griesbach, who worked for more than 30 years with schools and schools insurance, um, Carol Cutler, who has been here forever and doesn't seem to leave. Um, um, and we're also blessed to have a colleague who's been this year named John Zeziger. Um, John um, is one of only two Portage police officers who have pulled me over. Um, both times I deserved it. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, and uh, we are really lucky that in his retirement, John joined, decided to join us at Port Central High School um, to really help the school move. Um, right before spring break, um, one of our young men in class collapsed, um, had a cardiac arrest. Um, to this day, we still don't know what led to that cardiac arrest. Perfectly normal, uh, healthy young man, a junior here, a terrific young man. Um, and there is no question about it in my mind. Had John Zeziger had not been here, had his 30 years of police work um, really saving many other people's lives over his career, had he not been a colleague at Port Central High School, that young, would, that young man would have passed away that morning. John was the first person on the scene, um, the first person with an AED um, to use the AED here at Port Central High School, which we're blessed to have, to have CPR to keep that young man alive. Um, and to the EMTs and the fire folks and two EMP, EMT docs were all here to make sure he got safely down to Bronson Hospital. So he is very uncomfortable with all of us talking about him in front of him. Um, but I am so grateful that Mark th uh, was thoughtful enough to invite John to be here for us to be able to tell his story, to know that there's no exaggeration to say we have a young man who's alive here today, going through classes, doing what high school kids do, um, because John Zesger is here at Port Central High School. So we are really grateful. John, you have to come up here now. <laughs> This is the place where John, it makes, we make him feel even more uncomfortable by saying something to the rest of us. Well, you're not here, John. <laughs> so, so, well, I wanted to meet this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're just, we're, we're lucky that we have an AED on site that makes a huge difference. I'd recommend if we, not a drug related incident at all, but if we could have Narcan in the school, it's always nice to have that too. Because you never know when the next time someone might need it right away. Um, but I've given CPR probably a dozen times in my life. And when I was working over at Forge uh, Department of Public Safety, so most people live long enough to get to the hospital, but they didn't survive. And then 30 days before that, I had the opportunity at a store where a lady collapsed, and I was right there and, 
and she survived, and then our students survived too. So that's maybe I should have retired longer. Ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it just makes a big difference in being there. I had a great team. Everybody came together. You know, our assistant principal got the AED, was bringing it, and we all kind of worked together. It was, you know, it's not just me; it was everybody. But big difference in getting there as soon as possible, and having somebody that's trained, you know, as many people as trained, makes a big difference. He's doing, you know, he came back to school in two weeks, and it's amazing that to see him. And I'm so grateful that he's doing better, and I'm happy for his family. And I'm glad we all learned something that could have been very, very tragic. So, appreciate it. Thank you, Eric, and and John as well for. Uh, for your quick actions, as, as you say, uh, a couple of minutes makes a huge difference. And for someone to have the, the presence and the calmness to administer first aid as quickly as you did made a difference for that young man and his family. So uh, we appreciate everything that you did and, and stepping up and doing what comes naturally to you. So thank you for being part of our team. So those are all of the, uh, the, the uh, extra stuff on the agenda on the superintendent's <laughs> report and thank you for coming uh, that and so uh the next thing that that want to do is we have a trip planned uh, well we there are some people that are planning a trip to uh to france next uh for next summer so rachel's here to present that yeah, so we're excited um every two years about we bring a group of students here from Port Central uh, to France and this opportunity for our kids who have uh, studied in the classroom to take that outside the classroom and apply their skills. Um, and we went this past summer and just just to see these kids' faces as they're getting to use their French in a real setting and it was so sweet the last night. I was doing room checks and a few of the girls were like crying in the hotel room like this is like you weren't lying this is a, a life-changing experience so I was like this is why I do this um, to hear them they're like literally like you didn't see us earlier we're in the lobby in a huddle I was like whoa that's a scene man <laughs> that's awesome um, yeah so that's the kind of experience these kids have they get to experience things like no other I've been to France more than a dozen times and nothing is like a high school trip there's something so unique about that experience uh, that they get to do with their classmates. Um, the tour company we use gives them amazing opportunities to use their French, uh, and it's again way better than any trip that I've ever taken on my own or the ones that uh, this company leads. So it's an awesome opportunity. Any questions for me? I will just say the same thing I always say. Thank you for doing this. These are life-changing experiences. I have a child that became a Francophile after going in fifth grade at that time. Yeah. But ended up being a French major in college and is still in communication with people she met 25 years ago. So it's so, so life altering and thanks for doing it. And I, and I was the high school 16 year old who got to take the trip to Paris and then Geneva and it was life changing. Mm -hmm. This one is not Geneva. We go to Switzerland. I'm like, is Switzerland? Oh, yeah. It's not on this one. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we do dabble into to Switzerland on this one as well. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for being here yeah. and for taking this on. Yeah. Appreciate it. My pleasure. A lot of work, but it's totally worth it. I always tell the kids, like, that's what's, what's your excitement for it? Like, I don't usually see new things. I'm like, seeing your face, see the Eiffel Tower for the first time. Never gets old. <laughs> Never gets old. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Well, next uh, we have Johnny Edwards with our bond project update, and he has a couple of uh, special guests with him this evening as well. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Lang, as well as members of the Board of Education. Uh, tonight's presentation is going to be a little different, and uh, I'm going to ask my colleague, Dr. Kelly Jensenius, to take the lead on the special presentation. Sure, thank you. Um, 
Uh, good evening, Board of Trustees and uh, Superintendent Beeling. I do have Sarah Wagner here today with her students, a couple students from Central Elementary. So I'm going to actually hand it over to Mrs. Wagner to introduce her students. If you guys come over this way a little bit. All right, I'll be Can your you clicker. See? Do you want me behind or in front? <laughs> I didn't bring my step stool, and I have a few of those. And, you know, <laughs> all right, maybe we'll put you right here. Right over here. I will be you want to be there? To the side. Or to the side? Yeah, sure, why not you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how's that? Perfect. Perfect. And how about you here, and then I'll be in here. Okay. That's why the right furniture matters. <laughs> Good pitch. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Sarah Wagonar, and I am the principal at Portage Central L. I have the honor of introducing two third graders here, this is Gabby Walters and Logan Walagurski. They are here tonight to share with you a few things from the student perspective about how we are getting ready for our new building. We know that there are many steps that we need to take before we take the plunge and move into the new space. And these are just a few of the preliminary things that we've been doing from the student's side. So Gabby and Logan, are you ready? Yep, he's ready, okay. All right, Logan, are you ready to begin? I will add that all of the script is been created through the students. Dr. Vincent won't come by and we ran some things through them, but all of these are their words and ideas that they came up with. So, all right, guys, take it away. Go ahead, Logan. You're first. We now have our presentation looking into the future from our school. Central Mustangs. I'm Logan Wolgerski, the age of nine, and this is Gabby Walters, also from the age of nine. Uh, we are both food readers at Central Elementary School for now. <laughs> I'm, Ms. I'm in Miss LaDuke's class and Gabby is in Miss Cecile's. The timeline of Central Elementary is we get started in May of 2023. The cabinet is starting to come to life in October. This month, we can see the second floor is getting made really quick and it looks <coughs> awesome. The crane is lifting up really all the things to pull her to school. It is really cool and I can see it happening outside my classroom window. Finally, in the fall of 2025, we will have a great opening for our new school. Logan and I will be in the future. Before you say so we had the opportunity to ask our students if they had any questions for the builders and contractors out back. And so Logan's going to introduce some of the kid questions that were submitted to the office. It was so nice because the folks took all of our questions and provided some answers. And so we'd like to give you a preview of what we learned from now, the builders. Well, builders. now we have a student with a question. What will it look like? This, this is a picture that will show what, what our new school would look like. We are going to answer three questions from Central Elementary. The first question is, why do we need some heavy The answer is, the construction company, OA, says it's very heavy and you need to move a lot of it. The second question is, how many machines are working on our new school? The answer is, there are many different pieces of equipment and the number will vary throughout our project. We have nine machines in total right now. That's a lot of machines out there. Our last question is, how do you use controls to pick up the dirt? The answer is they're like joysticks in a video game. Oh, okay. Now this time there are many students on many questions of on just one paper. Do you know what the questions are? What color will it be? How do the cranes work? How do you know how do you know? What what do you like? Uh, sorry. How do you know what to do? What do you like to do? These questions were asked by Liana. Thank you, Liana. These are qu great questions. The first answer is one. The building will have many colors. Check out the picture to see. Number two. The crane is designed with a winch and able to pick up to pick up and move heavy objects. 
Number three, experience and training. Four, we like to work on new construction projects. I got one. Uh, last set of questions are what you seem to pick up to do. The answer is excellent. How many construction people are they called? There are one crane, five scratch hats, and four boots, and three ski ears. Our final question is what are the black poles out there for? For steel columns and that which hold up the floor move. I want to thank everyone for asking these questions and I'm glad it asked. Now, you know what? I know more about construction. All right. We adopted a new mask for the Mustang to prepare for our building. It makes us the same as middle and high schools. Here, what herd stands for. Help engage, respect, and do what's right. You can see in the beginning of each one of the first the first one is H, the second one is E, the third one is R, and the last one is D. Those letters spell heard. First, we design the layout <coughs> and prepare the new furniture. Second, we install carpet and furniture. All four of our fourth grade classrooms to try out the new furniture. The kids think the furniture is awesome. I'm sorry in the new school. I'm excited to try it out next year. They do all the issues who work so hard to design the job. All right. Well, half our school in the, sorry. I'm sorry. This presentation was done by reporters Gabby Walters and Logan Walgarski. You stop it in the text box before we finish this presentation. We will have our school in the fall of 2025. We want to thank everyone who has worked on, on it and so hard and appreciate you. From one and all, our new school is upward, rising and upgrading. Thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Wagner, and everyone else for all this hard work. We appreciate you taking the time having uh, this crew up here today. It was a lot of fun, and we hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We're going to be trying to incorporate uh, students on a fairly regular basis as throughout the project to update you. And, and I have to say, I can't, I can't let this go on without me saying something. Gabby's dad, Sean, who's sitting over there, um, the first time I've seen him in, in 34 years, he reminded me the years. Um, he was a student when I was high school principal up in Ionia. He was a student who also served on my student advisory board at Ionia High School. And he was the first class to occupy what was then a brand new building, a new facility. So construction is uh, not foreign to him. So I had to say that. That's Thanks for being here. Thanks again, kids, for, for your presentation and Sarah as well. So I would say that's definitely much better than any presentation I could have given. <laughs> <laughs> Best report ever. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. The last couple of years. So uh, this portion of me bring that down more than uh, Anastasia to help out with the challenge or the summary. Nice job. Nice job. Nice job. Nice job. Nice job. So approximately every other board meeting I try to just incorporate a few photos. This will be uh, brief. Um, the last time I showed you an aerial view of Central Elementary School, and I like to put the floor plan next to the aerial shot so you can kind of get in, uh, a look at how the building is taking shape. So this was the initial photo uh, showed uh, back in November of 2023. And then if we fast forward to March of 2024, Here's the latest aerial shot, uh, which shows now that second floor is in place on the northern side of the building. Uh, in the southwest corner is the gymnasium. You can see that the walls around the gymnasium is up and running. 
And then the southeast corner to the right is the administrative area, the library and art room. And you can see how those rooms are taking shape. This is another aerial view of Central Elementary School, uh, looking at the uh, second level on the bottom left. And then the right side, you'll see kind of a picture that really just zooms into the, uh, the entrance of the school. That's where the parking lot will be as people enter uh, the new school. And moving over to Haber Hill, uh, as Mark knows, uh, this is a staggered project. So this was Haber Hill's initial aerial shot that we showed several years ago. Similar layout to Central Elementary School. And that was November of 2023. This is what March 2024 looks like. Uh, if we were to take the shot today on that northern side of the building, more of the second floor is complete at this point. And here's a shot uh, of the school from one angle. And then that on the far right, you'll see more of the second floor uh, being laid. So that concludes my presentation. Just want to share a few pictures. Uh, before we get into the change order and uh, budget, are there any questions about uh, construction this part? Okay. Well, I'm going to ask Anastasia to uh, come up and help this next portion. Uh, Anastasia works side by side by Dan Rath tonight. He's unable to be here tonight. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so, Anastasia, you're going to get started with the uh, change order report. Um, if you guys have any questions, please stop me and let me know. We're going to start with your cover sheet. You'll see that not much has really changed with this document since the last time you saw it. You'll see that we have moved the funds from the change order or the um, contingency line up to the actual construction cost up above. We'll move over to the next page with our details here. Starting out with Central Elementary Item 1, Bulletin 6, included the relocation of the discus concrete pad and fencing. There was some stud wall clarifications, um, added structural piers, clarified lentil bearing plate requirements, and we added in some exterior wall pack lighting, and then there was a little bit of miscellaneous mechanical, electrical, and masonry updates for a total cost of $95,441, and this affected 10 contractors. Item two, which is bulletin seven, included updates to the stud wall framing tags, clarifications of wall types, as well as some masonry and mechanical clarifications for a total of $31,328, and this um, affected six contractors. Item three, which was bulletin eight, Revised um, window opening and blocking details. There was some door hardware revisions and updates to the CMU spray wall for a total of $9,925, which affected four contractors. Item four, which was lentil and bearing plate install cost for a total of $5,384 and that affected one contractor. Lastly, um, item five, this would be the future award of the following bid categories. Bid category two, asphalt paving to Michigan Paving and Materials. Bid category three, landscaping, county line nurseries. And bid category five, irrigation also to county line nurseries for a total of $45,474 out of contingency in that item. Um, and that was for three contractors. Um, Central Elementary Change Order 3 total is $187,552 out of contingency. Moving on to Hill, Item 1, Bulletin 1, included some structural updates and adjustment of the door hardware there as well. Uh, for a total cost of $51,183, this affected seven contractors. Item 2, Bulletin 2, um, there was updates to the egress distance and toilet room revisions. Um, this was per the state code after review. Um, there was also some clarifications to the lintel bearing plate requirements and locations for a total cost of $56,606. This um, affected 11 contractors. Item three, bulletin three, included updates to the electrical receptacle routing, um, adjusted those electrical, circuits and there was some control joint clarifications in the masonry for a total of $7,626 and that affected eight contractors. 
Item four is an allowance that we used for some construction road around the building. This included additional um, temporary road around the building for crane and masonry um, access. So this was a zero cost change from contingency, but we did use $97,050 out of one of our allowances, and that was um, for one contractor. Item five, bulletin four. There was some updates to the plumbing fixture tags um, some door hardware provisions, as well as some mechanical updates for a total of 35941 and this item um, affected two contractors. Item six was an additional phase to the construction road, um, just kind of adding a little bit more to that to allow for access on um, additional sides of the building. This also used allowances for $30,663, so again, zero out of um, contingency there and that affected one contractor. Item seven was a fire alarm vendor change. This was um, requested during our post bids and this is the um, change order for the contractor. We also, we held an allowance for this during our initial recommendation to the board of 25,000. Um, so we used the 25,000 from the allowance that we held there was an additional $29 from that item that we pulled from contingency, and that affected one contractor. Item eight was um, unsuitable soil removal. We um, used an allowance again for this one of $6,314. The cost for this was to haul off the unsuitable soils um, from creating that access road around the building. Lastly, item nine would be the award of the following bid categories. Bid category two, asphalt paving, Reef Riley construction. Bid category three, landscaping, two online <coughs> nurseries. Bid category four, fencing, would be justice fence. Bid category five, irrigation, also two county line nurseries. Bid category 22, resilient athletic flooring, Great Lakes flooring specialist. And bid category 23, um, visual display units, platinum visual display solutions. In this case, there would be an add back to contingency of $36,179 after those allowances that we held again during your initial um, board recommendation that you guys approved previously. Um, this affects six contractors. The total for Haver Hills Change Order 3 was $115,206 out of contingency. Are there any so, yeah, just a quick check in on this. I mean, all projects have contingencies that get used. Are, are you comfortable that we're, we're cutting into contingencies at a typical pace and you're feeling comfortable that we'll have enough contingency money there to, to get yes. us through what lies ahead? <laughs> yes, all of the changes that we've been seeing so far are typical with where we're at with the um, stage of construction. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And that, I believe, concludes uh, our section of the agenda. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll move forward with board education. Uh, and this is a report on our community survey that the board commissioned. Uh, Gary Gosensky from um, Perspectives Consulting Group is here um, to present the survey. Welcome, Gary. Good evening, trustees. Superintendent B. Lang, it's a pleasure to be before you and present the summary of the 2024 community survey completed for Pledge Public Schools. It was conducted just about a the first two weeks of January, there, just after January 15th through the 26th of this year. So you're getting the results about three months down from when we conducted the survey. It's a 30 question survey. The survey itself was conducted online. In order to ensure the maximum participation that we could get, a postcard was sent to all households in the district, inviting them to take the survey with a link and a QR code that they could access the survey with. As such, we asked everyone to be a resident of Portage Public Schools and be at least 18 or older. We received a total of 490 usable surveys. Some people started the survey and didn't necessarily complete it, but of those who completed it, we had 490, which gives us a margin of error plus or minus 4.4%. In this day and age of political polling, you're hearing margins of error all the time. In our industry, we consider plus or minus 5% to be the standard, so plus or minus 4.4 is actually better than that because it's a tighter tolerance on the error margin. 
The data was weighted, and as such, I need to explain just briefly that when we conduct surveys like this for school districts, and we do them for districts all over the state of Michigan, we have always encountered more parents taking the survey than people who have no children in the schools. So when parents take the survey, we know they sometimes answer questions differently than those who don't have children in the schools. So when we get more parents and fewer non-parents, we weight the data to make it proportional. And what that means in this case is we weighted it so that approximately 40% of the survey respondents were parents and 60% were not, which reflects the Kalamazoo County average for schools in the county, which is 40% parents. You received two report documents. The first one affectionately called report is 82 pages. It has a summary of all 30 questions. The second one responses listing is 118 pages and includes all of the responses. The differentiation here is that in the first report, to keep it to 82 pages, we have selected responses to some of the questions and not all of them. If you wish to read every response from every person, including all the survey respondents, even with the waiting, they're in that second document. I want to go over a couple questions just briefly about the district as a whole. The first one is the overall grade for Portage Public Schools. They were given a choice of A, B, C, D, and F. You'll see that about one quarter of the survey respondents gave it an A, 41% of B, and 23% A, C. And as you can see, there's a couple who gave it A, D, or an F. And as such, when you read the report, you'll actually find that we asked survey respondents who gave the district a D or an F. Why did you give the district a D or an F? And you can read those responses in the report. As you can see, that was relatively few. We then followed that with a question about the academic programs here at Portage Public Schools. Same grading scale. You'll see it graded a little higher at the A level at 33, or one out of every three survey respondents gave it an A. About 43% of B and 14% of C. And again, if you look in the report, you'll see for those who gave it a D or an F, they were asked why they gave it that, and that information is available to you. As you'll know from our work previously on the surveys related to facilities, including the elementary and middle school surveys in 2015, 2020, and 2021, this is a question that we've asked historically. Do you feel Portage Public Schools are fiscally responsible, providing three choices, yes, no, and I'm sure? In this case, you'll see that yes was 43.8% of the survey respondents, one third were unsure, and 23% said no. It's important to recognize that this question has been asked historically, and the results differ slightly from previous years, although not dramatically. If they said no, you're not fiscally responsible, then the top responses included the administration is overpaid, lack of investment in teachers, and past bonds. I think the first two are self-explanatory. Past bonds most frequently reference the construction of a new football stadium at Portage Northern. This was a bond that I believe was approved and construction was executed now seven years ago. Having said that, it still does show up on the survey at this point. One question that we asked this time that we uh, wanted to get a handle on, especially for the board as they look at the value of Portage Public Schools and trying to be good custodians of the resources here, when choosing to live in Portage, was living in the Portage Public Schools a factor in your decision? And for three quarters of the people surveyed, yes, living in Portage Public Schools was a factor. So we took those three quarters and we said, are you happy with the decision? You made a decision to live in Portage Public Schools, and of those who said yes, three quarters of them said they were happy with that decision. You'll see a couple who were unsure and a couple who said no, but uh, those results to that question are again very favorable for Portage Public Schools. Once again, the board commissioned the survey to get a variety of different information, and one of the things they asked about was the top three issues facing or that the district must address at this time. And you'll see that there's a variety of different responses there. We gave them a list. So in discussion and preparation of the survey, we provided a list of about 22 different items. Not all of them are on this chart, but there's a majority of them there. Quality of education was the top issue that was named, followed by teachers teaching, safety, curriculum, and finally trust in the top five. 
statistically, a plus or minus four margin of error coming in play. You can safely say the quality of education is the top issue. Would be again if we repeated the survey. But if you looked at teachers teaching safety curriculum and trust as an example, that margin of error window would say that those could appear in a different order if we conducted the survey. Again, there's enough play in that margin of error that that would be the case. But as you can see, the common theme between quality of education, teachers teaching, and curriculum in the top five. The other thing that we explored on the survey, which again is a policy governance board, you develop end statements about what you believe the district's purpose and what it should be accomplishing. We used the word goals on the survey. And so we shared each of the five with residents one at a time. So this is an example of goal number one, students demonstrate continuous improvement in the mastery of core curriculum standards with results approaching or exceeding the highest performing comparable districts. And having shared that, we then said, do you feel this is a satisfactory goal? And you can see that 81% of the survey respondents said, yes, this is a satisfactory goal. We had just under one out of 10 say they were unsure, and similar numbers say they did not feel it was satisfactory. Again, you'll find why they didn't feel it was satisfactory in the report, as we did ask for responses to explain that. Having said that, you can imagine this question being repeated four more times for goal two, three, four, and five. And so you can see the results on this chart here. Goal one, again, had 81% saying yes, it was satisfactory. Goal two, which is the learning and leadership skills goal, had 86% saying satisfactory. Resilience in life, goal three was 80%. 87% for goal four, and 83% for goal five. So my takeaway for you is just very simply, eight out of 10 residents surveyed felt that the goals that you have, the end statements that you have for the district are satisfactory. Once again, you can see if they disagreed on something, you can see the results in the no and unsure categories within the report as we followed up with them. Here are the most common reasons why they did not feel that the goals were satisfactory. There were some people who felt the goals should be more ambitious, that there should not be a comparison to other districts, that there should be more focus on academics. And what that really meant was beyond the first goal for goals two, three, four, and five, if they disagreed, they felt the focus should be more primarily on goal number one. They felt there were some things in the goals that they didn't perceive to be the school's responsibility to address. And finally, that there needed to be a focus on paths beyond college. So those are some of the most common reasons, but once again, you can read those in their entirety within the report. Then for each goal, we asked a second question. And we said, do you feel that Puerto Rico public schools are working effectively toward accomplishing this goal? And again, I put all five goals on the same chart for you, so you can see what's there. For goal number one, academic success, 45% thought, yes, you're working effectively toward accomplishing that goal. 41% for goal two, 32% for goal three, 41% for goal four, and 36% for goal five. The takeaway from this chart is, is if you add together no, and unsure, over half of all residents surveyed said either nope, you're not working effectively toward this, or they're unsure. So less than half on any of the five recognize that you're working effectively toward it. I, I feel I must comment only that I'm aware of the fact that the district does have monitoring reports for each and every one of these, which are documented in the new review as trustees. There just appears to be a disconnect with the community in the ability to, to, for them to pick that up from the outside. What is clear is some of these monitoring reports, all of which appear on the website, are long and they appear throughout the year. So there, there's certainly a challenge for someone. You would have to be doing your homework to follow along if you're going to follow the monitoring reports. But I would just say that there is a disconnect in the understanding that, yes, you are working effectively toward the five goals, albeit over 80% for each of the five felt they were. So that's factory goals. We did ask, are there other goals the district should have? Are there other end statements that should be included? And there were several that were commonly named. One, there, there was a thought that there should be goals around curriculum. 
There were several people who won goals around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Special education, safety, and student behavior were also named. Once again, when you read the response that's in the report, you'll see more detail about these. We categorized them in groups here, but there's probably three or four pages of suggested other goals that appear within the report. There's also within the report about 10 pages of other comments about the district. It was the last question. Do you have any other comments you wish to share about Puerto Rico Public Schools? It was an open-ended question. You could say what you wish. I would encourage you trustees to spend not only time with the report part, but to spend time with the responses listing. I know it's a much longer read, and there's a lot of information there, but especially the question of other comments which transcends some of the topics we discussed, but more often things that weren't discussed on the survey, is definitely worth your time to look at. So in conclusion, I remind you that 490 residents did complete this survey, so that you have the results of the 490, and over 80% of them felt that each of the five goals, as listed, were satisfactory, but most residents are either unsure or don't feel that part of public schools are working effectively toward accomplishing the goals. So. I've highlighted the results of the survey in my presentation here uh, in respect for your time and realizing that you do have the copy of the report. I will ask, is there either a question I didn't cover that you had a question about or a question anything other I can answer for you? How many residents were received it, received the survey? So how many people actually, what percentage of people actually completed it? The, 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 a postcard was sent to all households in the Portage Public Schools District. So in and of itself, that would be somewhere, I'm going to guess, but Michelle's at the back. 45,000. 45,000. <coughs> that sounds a little high. 20,000 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, households. Yeah. Okay. We essentially use the same list that we use for the Portager, plus those building, those neighborhoods that are outside of Portage, but are part of Portage's district. Okay. So is this low for, for Portage Public Schools as far as people filling out the survey? It seems like you should have way more people complete it. There, there have been previous surveys that we've done related to things like the elementary schools most recently. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest that there might have been a reason, especially with some of the citing issues around the elementary schools, that more people might have taken that survey. 1,370 took the elementary school survey. 490 took this one. Um, I would suggest that there was perhaps more publicity around that one, but I would not consider this to be a low response in the sense that we are at a comfortable margin of error, plus or minus 4.4%. I feel comfortable with the results as you see them, and other than, for example, in the top issues category, most of the questions are clear, clear cut. They, they either, you know, they believe it's satisfactory or they haven't heard of it, and the percentages are significant outside of the margin. So this survey would be considered a good representation of the district as a whole? As we weighted it to reflect the percentage of parents in the district, yes, I would concur that it is. Would you, maybe a better way to say it, when we had 1,300 respondents, there was more contention about things related to the elementary school projects, people who were objecting to site locations and so forth, people who really wanted to see a new school, so people were on it. It seems like things are going along really smoothly right now. There aren't a lot of issues of contention, so people don't tend to come forward when things are going well. Do you think that's a fair estimation or not? It would be my um, suggestion that that's the most likely reason why more people completed the survey in 2021 than did this year. And while that may be spot on, uh, if somebody gave us a D or an F, you asked them why. Yes, sir. And then in the feedback, it was all there. Yes, sir. So this was hard to read. You had to have a thick skin, right? And we asked for it. We, we asked for it, we agreed. <laughs> we agreed if they were a DNF, they'd tell us why. And so, um, so there's lots of stuff in there. Um, and it's, you know, it's, so I, anyway, I, if, if anybody has not made it through the whole thing, I would encourage it. 
And I mean, reading some of that, you can see how some of that is miscommunication and some of this stuff is, you know, it's kind of technical and, but some of that stuff in there, I think we can address. And we just we have to take a deep breath and sort through it. And, you know, there are two or three things, you know. I mean, the, the thing about we're 40, uh, around 40 to 45 percent of our community says that they don't know how we're performing on some of those things. Yes. I, I'm not sure we can reduce that appreciably because mm -hmm. people are busy and getting the information in front of them and having them digest it is, is hard. But we can try harder. <laughs> we, can, mm -hmm. we can try harder to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I say that as chair of the owner linkage committee. Um, I think that's something we've got to own yeah. and, and try, try some new yeah. things. I was just going to say that. Maybe not try harder, but just try something different to get it out to mm -hmm. people in a different way. Yeah. Trustee, I will, I will suggest to you your point about the reading the report being difficult. We have found that when we ask someone, so why do you think Portage Public Schools are fiscally responsible? If they said yes, they're going to say all sorts of good things, none of which you would change. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm all of which are relevant, all of which are important, but they don't add any information you can take action on. So by design, every single one of the survey questions explores either why somebody said no or why they were unsure. And most often this brings up a tone of negativity in cases that it is very difficult to read, and I concur with you that it is a challenge to read through sections of the report, but I hope that all of you understand that the information that's coming from this is what residents in the community believe to be the case at this time. As you indicated, maybe some of it is misperception, but the reality of it is, is that that's what they think is happening at this point, um, such that we see this type of response in other districts and other surveys. We absolutely do. This is not unique to Portage, because once again, we're asking, why didn't you think we do this, or why were you unsure that Portage did this, and those by default are not positive answers. So having said that, I would encourage not only you, but anyone else who takes a look at it to recognize that the vast majority of people for every single question didn't have a response because they believed you were fiscally responsible or were communicating well or you were grading an A, B, C. Seeing 50% or, so, or more in some cases of working effectively towards goals says that we have some work to do. And it may be perception, it may be education, it may be changes that we need to make, but this at least gives us a guideline to do so. And when you know better, you can do better. So it's good that we know. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll be having some more discussions down the way. Gary, you might even be involved in some. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we really appreciate your work on this and presenting this tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the opportunity. It's going to be of service to the Board of Public Board of Education. I look forward to future conversations. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move forward to our comments and communication section. Is there anyone, no one wishes to address the board this evening? So uh, we'll start with uh, comments from board trustees, please. Yeah, right. C can I say my usual so we convene for an extra two or two and a half hours for a, kind of a special uh, retreat today to focus on our 1.1 uh, end statement? I'll let other people say what they thought of it, but it, it was, I mean, once again, it was, it was good, spirited discussion. Um, maybe kind of boring, maybe kind of in the weeds, but I think people are, trustees are finding it kind of exciting to debate <laughs> kind of how, you know, how we set our goals and how we set our expectations for things going on in the district. I'll say what I said earlier, that in 10 years, I think that's the best retreat I've ever been to. It just seemed like we made a lot of progress and we were all really focused on simplifying and that all is really good stuff so in a positive way it was an opportunity to get into the weeds so to speak in a mm -hmm. way that doesn't normally lend itself right you use the word spirited I would add very respectful mm -hmm. and very collaborative mm -hmm. so I have to have a couple of other things um, 
I saw, and I was just trying to find it on social media so I could accurately talk about it, but uh, a thing that's coming to North Middle School, like a guy from Top Chef or uh, a, that kind of <clears throat> show? Jet Tilla. Okay. Uh, Jet is a... Uh, well, oh, Susan's here. <laughs> Susan, come on! He's been in the district before. He visited West Middle School and... Uh, 2019. Yes, it's been a few years, but... He was supposed to be at North Middle um, in 2020, and then the pandemic. Okay. Well, that just looks like such a cool thing and something for kids to get really excited about that's definitely out of the ordinary. So I thought that was so exciting when I saw that, and I don't know what part you played in that, but great. <laughs> okay, well, hey, thanks for doing that. So that's super. Um, also, just a heads up that Portage Central Middle School is doing Beauty and the Beast this weekend, and uh, I've heard a little sneak peek of Gaston's song, and it was amazing. So if you think this is like your mother's middle school production, it is not. It is really very top notch and it's a junior production so that means it only lasts a little over an hour. So you can just go and know that it's going to be short and sweet. So go take your kids, whatever. Um, and then I think Randy, you have the community teen read so I won't say anything about that. I'll let you talk about it. Okay, very good. Anyone else? I would add one more brief thing, but um, Mark, in your opening, and you were talking about uh, Dan Mastic mm -hmm. and some adjectives there. Um, a couple others that, that popped into my, my mind that I would add, Dan was calming and Dan was wise. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Can I say something about Dan, too? Sure. Um, I probably have known Dan as long as he worked for the district, so that goes back 20 years or more. Um, I didn't know him well initially. He was just someone that I saw walking around and knew he was involved in the tech stuff. Um, but I am so glad that I had the opportunity over the past 10 years to really get to know him better and to appreciate that wisdom and that calm demeanor and really care and concern about others and about what's going on in the district, but personal care and concern for his family and other people. So um, it was a gift to me, to all of us, I think, that we had the opportunity to know Dan that way. Anyone else? I like everyone else, uh, Miss Dan. Um, Dan was always uh, just a calm and calm in the face of anything. You could always count on him for uh, his wisdom and knowledge about a variety of subjects, not just uh, mm -hmm. IT. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, uh, the work he did to design our technology here, we're going to enjoy the benefits of that for years to come. So. Uh, well, we miss him, and uh, he was a big loss to the district. Um, the only other thing I have is the community in Reed. I don't know if you had a chance to go to uh, the event, but it was uh, it was it was fantastic. Uh, the attendance was really good, and um, Ruta Septus, the the author, was probably the most one of the most engaging speakers that I've ever heard in my life. So. I just like to give a shout out to uh, our librarians for uh, the choice of uh, the book this year, Salt to the Sea, and uh, the foundation and everyone else who uh, sponsored the event. It was, it was really a great thing for our students and a great thing for the community. And uh, with that, I think that's all we have, and we can move forward to the consent agenda. We have just a couple items here on page 32. Approval of the minutes from the March 11th, 2024 regular business meeting and closed session and policy revision. The policy 144.2, board member ethics, 0617.3, public participation at board meetings, comment at board meetings, policy 9130, public complaints, and policy 2521, selection of instructional materials and equipment. Uh, this, these policies have been under discussion by the board for a number of months and uh, they were uh, shared with the public for the first time at our last meeting. 
Are there any exceptions to the consent agenda as presented? Now, hearing none, the consent agenda is uh, approved. And we'll meet, move to uh, our next agenda item, Assurance of District Performance, and that's Monitoring Report 1.3 on page 32. Mark. Thank you. Um, hopefully you'll recognize that this report is very similar to, uh, in format from what, to what was presented previously. Uh, a couple things I just want to draw your attention to uh, on page uh, 37 is uh, our teachers are beginning to use uh, this instrument called Sabres, uh, which is, is a tool that allows them to assess the student acquisition of some of these skills. Um, and so just like they do with academics, they're looking to see where the gaps are, where we need to have interventions, where students uh, and teachers can work better together to develop some of the, the skills that are identified uh, here on self-awareness, uh, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, and self-management. Uh, and then also, on, uh, we had a professional development day last Friday, uh, district-wide development day, and some of the sessions there were devoted to how teachers can embed uh, teaching these skills through the content areas. Uh, one in particular that, uh, that I stopped by for a little bit was uh, through the English language arts curriculum. Uh, just through the, the texts that are chosen, through activities that can occur as a result of both exploring the text and the content, as well as developing some of these skills. So uh, this work is happening across the district. Uh, obviously we can't do everyone at every grade level at the same time, but uh, we're, we're focusing on some areas as we unpack these standards and get to know them. So that's, that's work that's, that's on, ongoing across the district. Um, but also in the meantime, we're looking at are there other ways we might be able to get some feedback around how these skills um, are being uh, acquired and, and kind of the, the uh, results of acquiring those skills. And that's to look at some of the questions that we use in our student experience uh, survey. So on page 36, you'll you see the uh, the results of that survey uh, from last year, uh, the, the number of students that took the, uh, the, the uh, survey instrument, and then the four questions that we feel are, are somewhat tied to these standards. And uh, we're right now in the, in the midst of administrating, administering this year's uh, survey, and uh, so next year we'll have some data that we can start making some comparisons and, and at least look at this and see how our students are doing. Um, and how we might adjust to that. So that's this year's report, and uh, hopefully, you know, the, you'll get the idea that we we do embrace these. Um, they are aligned with the the state's social emotional skills, and we are um, working with our teachers to make sure they're embedded in our curriculum. And I'll be happy to answer your questions if you have any. But I would, um, <clears throat> I, I would add um, in the in the survey that you know we discussed the results of the survey, and so this is one of those areas where some people don't think that this is as important as the others, and those folks would be more of the three R's kind of thing, um, which I have to admit, at one point in my life I was kind of more in that camp, um, and then the pandemic happened, and the kids came back from that, and we found a spike in relationship issues and kids, you know, and, and it just as a trustee, it helped me really appreciate more that schools are where kids learn how to get along with other people. Um, and, and so it, it just sharpened up for me that this is really important. So I appreciate, appreciate everything in here. And, and we're definitely seeing the impact that COVID had. And, uh, you know, kids being together in, a, in one space is different than kids learning uh, alone. So very much so, we're still seeing that and uh, doing what we can to address it. And, and I think the data that you have showed us is that right, post-pandemic spike, that is now settling back in and it's looking more like it was looking pre-pandemic, uh, but it takes some time and that's an important function of our schools. <coughs> Anyone else have any questions for Mark? 
Well, Mark, I just like to say I appreciate you adding those questions to the student experience survey because this is a very hard thing to quantify, and that's a that's a stab at it. Appreciate that. And then uh, just so everyone knows that this particular long-term goal that the board has for the district is that students have social emotional learning competencies, including skills in self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making to build resilience to navigate life. So uh, thank you for your report, sir. It was a good one. And there's a motion on page 32 to approve it. President Van Antwerp, I move that the Board of Education accept as presented the monitoring report on 1.3 N's as a reasonable interpretation and evidence of compliance with policy. Thank you, Terry. Is there a second, please? Second. Thank you, Keith. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion passes. And we'll move forward to our first, first action item was the Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week proclamation on page 40. President Van Antwerp, I move that the Board of Education approve the Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week proclamation as presented. Thank you, Terry. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Can someone read that for us, please? That would be honored to. Thank you, Keith. There is a strong, effective, free public education for all children is critical to our democracy at the national, state, and local level. And Whereas a strong public school system makes for a strong community, and whereas the vision of Portage Public Schools is to be an exceptional, continuously improving learning culture with high expectations committed to all, and whereas the commitment Portage Public Schools teachers and staff show to students by inspiring them to succeed academically, artistically, socially, and athletically is essential to making the vision a reality. And whereas our educators go above and beyond for our students, making a lasting contribution to their lives. Therefore, the Board of Education at Portage Public Schools does hereby proclaim May 6 through 10, 2024, as Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week in the Portage Public School District and encourages all citizens to thank educators for their daily work. Adopted on this 15th day of April, 2024, by the Portage Public Schools Board of Education. Thank you, Keith. Any comments? Well, I would just like to say that we just completed um, visits of most of our school buildings and we got to see our teachers in action and we got to see some pretty amazing things. And I'm even more convinced that Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week ought to be every week <laughs> because uh, the work that we saw and the, the learning that's going on and, and the dedication there is, is just amazing. So we just want to thank our teachers and staff for all that you do for kids. We really appreciate it. And with that, uh, all those in favor of approving the Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week proclamation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion passes. And we'll move to our second action item, which is district-wide access control building entrance renovations. There's a motion on page 42, please. Mr. President, uh, I move that the Board of Education approve the contract for district-wide access control building entrance renovations to Hall Builders of Pawpaw, Michigan, the amount of $703,560 with the 10% contingency. These funds will come from carryover section 97, safety and security funding. Thank you. Bozer, second, please. Second. Thank you. Um, Johnny, are you? Uh, Sammy Stevens, our business Sammy. manager, can... Uh, can speak to this item. I just wanted to remind the board that this request was sent to us electronically on March 25th, and I'm not aware of any questions or issues with this proposal. So thank you for taking us through it. Yeah, not a problem. So this is, or good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Beeling, sorry. Um, so this is actually the second bid package to a bid to a complete package or project that we have. I brought the first bid package to you um, in our meetings in February and March, I believe it was. So this is the second one, um, and this will kind of, um, along with the recommendation that I'll um, talk to you about later on, um, kind of wrap up our safety and security project that Dr. Michael Pasco is working on with Dr. Edwards. 
um, along with numerous others in the district. Um, but this one will focus on Central High, Northern High, Moore's Bridge, um, and then the corridors at West uh, Middle School. And it just helps um, align us with those recommendations from the safety or from the security assessment that we had by SEC um, back in, I think it was last spring it was. Um, so that'll just kind of bring it all together and finalize that piece along with that recommendation later this evening. Any questions for Sammy? Well, it was a, it, it was a, a fun moment this weekend as I was reading the survey and there was a verbatim comment on making the uh, the access entrance to Central High a more uh, secure entrance and I knew that this was coming up so um, yeah, this is important stuff thank you Sammy this is something I have wondered why some of our schools were more open than otherwise and so I'm glad to see it yeah. I'm glad and, to see this happening. Yeah, and a lot of that is due to the state of Michigan and their funding that they've been able to provide us with and really move us in that direction. And Dr. Vasco taking the opportunity and really getting us to where we need to be and where we need to have our students safe and everything. So, having been a teacher who has arrived at school in the morning and had discussions with colleagues of based on recent events at that time what will we do to keep our students safe this is real yeah. and 100 percent needed I completely agree yeah. thank you thank you Appreciate it. any other comments all those in favor of the district-wide access control building entrance renovations please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed the motion passes and we'll move forward to our first discussion item, which is the PA and clock system upgrades. And I think Sammy's coming up again. Um, this evening, you will find a recommendation in your board packet um, for a contract with Parkway Electric out of Holland, Michigan, in the amount of $328,000. $328,000, $372,000. Which does include a 10% 10, 10 per, 10, 10 contingency, and that is for upgrades to the public address system and clock systems at 12th Street, Lake Center, Central High, and Northern High. Um, these funds will come from 31AA, which is another state categorical that we have um, for the 23-24 fiscal year. I've kind of we kind of mentioned it in the budget amendment. Um, they took section 7097 and section 31 AA and combined them together. Um, so this will come from the 31 AA funding that we will receive this year. Um, but this contract, again, will allow for replacement of that PA and clock system at those four <coughs> schools. It'll bring them up to the same caliber as our middle schools, as well as bringing them up to very, very similar specs for our new elementary schools. Um, and this bid package does have associated fees with it with Tower Pinkster in the amount of $21,500, which is under that $100,000 threshold that we, will, that we would have to bring to you um, in the event for approval. Um, the two high schools are expected to be completed over the summer, um, and then the two elementaries are expected to be completed by January of 2025, which is all within that um, window of having to have those funds spent. Um, it was competitively bid with the assistance uh, from Tower Pinkster. We received two responses with Parkway being the um, lowest bidder. Um, and I'm happy to hear questions. It's probably important to remember that the buildings that you're talking about were constructed well over 10 years ago and the climate has changed a lot, so there was no lack of responsibility when those buildings were built, but things have changed to some degree that would cause us to think that we needed to upgrade. Right. So. Exactly, and the other thing, I mean, technology, we see how fast technology yes. changes, and so this just brings the entire district up to the same caliber, the same speed, and it helps us um, guide those I can't think of the word that I'm looking for. Um, but when systems reach their lifespan, it's hard to find parts. Mm -hmm. So with this opportunity, we want to upgrade our system and make it the best it can possibly be in the event 
of a, a natural disaster or a disaster in general, which I pray that we never ever see or have to experience, but it just really allows us to be that much better and that much better. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you. I, I'd just like to give a shout out to Dr. Pascoe and Dr. Edwards for going at this project because between what we approved in February, what we just approved now, and what we're being asked to approve next month, uh, you brought in over $1.2 million to the district, and you did that by applying for the mental health and the safety uh, mm -hmm. categoricals. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I understand it, not all districts did that. And we're the beneficiaries of it, and uh, so we want to thank you very much. And I think it would be really good on our part if we could bring this one to action tonight so we could get all this done this summer. So, Bo, do you have a motion? <laughs> <laughs> the first one's easy. So, uh, would this perhaps be something on page 51? Uh, no, it'd be on uh, page 47. 46, well, 46. I'm... And while Bo's developing the motion, could someone... I move that we bring this item to action. Second. Thank you. All those in favor of bringing this item to action, please say aye. 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 The motion is now an action item. Bo? Uh, Mr. President, <laughs> uh, I move that the Board of Education approve the contract for upgrades to the public address and clock systems at 12th Street Elementary, Lake Center Elementary, Central High School and Northern High School, Parkway Electric of Holland, Michigan, in the amount of $328,372, which includes a 10% contingency. These funds will come from 33A, Mental Health and School Safety State Categorical Funding. Thank you, Bullis. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. And we'll move to our next discussion item, which is the Central Elementary Construction Contract. Thank you again. I'm joined by uh, Anastasia for these next two uh, recommendations. The first of which is related to Central Elementary School. Uh, this is a continuation of bids for uh, construction. Be a category two related to asphalt paving. Be a category three related to landscaping. And be a category five related to irrigation. Uh, as we have done the, the majority or the heavy lifting of the bid back in the summer of 2023, these projects were not anything that needed to be uh, put out the bid so early. So now we're coming up into that time where we're getting closer to uh, uh, our next round of summer work. And these three categories uh, equate to $706,000 uh, amongst them. The contracts awarded to Michigan Paving and Materials for asphalt paving, county lines nursery for landscaping, and then county line nurseries for irrigation. Um, Anastasia or I will be happy to answer any questions you might have about this recommendation. Johnny, the timeline that we're on allows this work to be completed this summer without having to move this to action tonight. You want to talk about, I think, the asphalt paving. Um, that one is on Haverhill, actually. Um, Central, there, we are good on. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then moving over to, uh, to Haverhill, uh, a similar recommendation. Uh, that their particular amount is $551,098. Uh, there are more categories related to uh, this particular package that includes big categories two for asphalt paving, three for landscaping, four for camping, then for category five for irrigation, 22 for reserve and athletic floor, and then 23 for visual display units. Each of the awarded contractors are also listed in the recommendation, and that total equals to $551,000. $98. And so, Anastasia, could you just talk a little bit about the urgency around or your request around that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, over on Heaver Hill, there's a little bit more logistics um, involved in terms of getting um, access to the site from, um, I believe it's Coulter there. So we are having to do phases of the asphalt. So we're going to do. Um, 
believe it's in the street the, name, yeah so Manhattan we're versus yeah Ma Marlo. yeah so really we we have to break this out into phases to allow construction still access to the site while not shutting down the road completely either for residents um, so with part of that we are looking to do some of that work this summer actually and then breaking out the rest into um, the next summer when we complete the rest of the If the board were comfortable, Haverhill <coughs> recommendation related to asphalt is a higher priority. Um, but if, if not, we can start to wait to the extent to take <coughs> whatever is the board in terms of the level of uh, Would the board be agreeable to Sure. I move that we move it to action. Is there a second? Second. Quick, favor. quick discussion, just to yeah. be clear, moving Central and Haverhill to action. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor of moving these items to action, please say aye. 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 Okay, and we just need a motion to approve the Central and Haverhill construction contracts. <laughs> That'll do it. I move that we move uh, to approve the Central and Haverhill construction contracts. Nicely said. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Great. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you guys really put on the hard sell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our next discussion item is purchase of decodable text and literacy library materials. Well, you're an expert on everything, I know. <laughs> I know. It's just, you know. <laughs> Uh, so in your report packet is another recommendation for the purchase of uh, elementary decodable text and learning library text, uh, text so books, no, they're not textbooks, but they're reading books, um, for the total of 326, 306,000. This purchase will come from ESSER 3 federal funding. Um, and we uh, had to take this out for bed, and we had three different sections. So the first one um, was awarded to uh, the Reading League for the Coldable Text Met, or Coldable Text, um, and that is for K, K through 2. And then uh, the second one was awarded to Book Bug, uh, just local here in Portage, um, for the text for the Learning Library, and that's for grades 2 through 5. And then Lakeshore Learning was awarded for carts for storage of those texts because there will be hundreds and hundreds of textbooks coming in. Um, hopefully, once this uh, purchase is approved, um, it's been I've had a lot of I've had my hands in this a lot, and it's been really cool to learn about this. Um, I was talking with uh, Dr. Jensenius and uh, Dr. Sheehan this morning or this afternoon. And they were telling me more about the purchase. Um, just for your guys' peace of mind, all the reading specialists and librarians have viewed the majority of these text messages. Um, they can be used independently or in a small group setting. Um, for example, those decodable texts, they come in packages of one, five, or 20. Um, and then there's like a so, that's how many books like are in that package of each and there's like five or six books that are available to the student. Um, and then there's, again, various books to help them understand their core curriculum. Um, it will provide additional practice opportunities for the students to connect and deepen and extend their knowledge in the core curriculum. And like I had mentioned, it's all based off of their, they're connected to their core skills. Um, this was bid through a formal bidding pet, uh, process because it is such a large purchase. Um, and we received nine responses, which is quite large. Um, but all of these, these three vendors were chosen based off of availability and the product that they had available for them. Happy to answer any questions. Forgive my ignorance. What is a decodable text? Yeah. I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited, actually. I'm really excited about this. Yes. Ellie and I had this. It's, it's a good thing. It is. So, for example, if we're learning about the vowel or the <laughs> short I sound, like in pig, so the I, uh -huh. the decodable text is a set of text that focuses on that short I sound. Awesome. Okay, cool. So yes. think of the Bob books. That would be yes. a very elementary illustration of 
what they are if you ever had the Bob books for your kids. Yeah. Working on sounding out the words instead of relying on memorizing. This is what the yes. word looks like. Exactly. Which is so important. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Memorizing or guessing. Yes. yes. <laughs> because we've dealt with that in our family. Um, They're really cool. Being able books. to sound it out makes it possible to read it later. Awesome. And important with a short I sound, right? <laughs> me, uh, the, me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go study my short eyes. <laughs> but I have the book books. I'll bring. Okay. Them. Okay. I'll look forward to them. Being able to sound out those big words that you've never seen before, yeah. instead of just looking at the first three letters and guessing that this is the word that it is, and it makes no sense whatsoever, but you're going with it. Uh, yeah, having that decodable practice is enormous for future reading skills. And the literacy libraries, or the literacy, or the learning libraries, sorry, um, are additional books for them to use, like, if they're learning about people that changed the world, like, we have that set, you know, those set few books for curriculum, but this just gives them more opportunity to learn about those people that are changing the world, or nice. to learn about the animals that, you know, they might not learn about in core curriculum. So it's, it's really cool and it's something that um, from my standpoint we've been talking about since we received SR3 funding and it's just like now it's like okay like we're moving full force and so it's been really fun to work with curriculum um, and purchasing to get this purchase all together. Like we've kind of moved out a couple of times because oh, this is really cool. Like uh, we were really excited also to be able to award hopefully award this to BookBug as well. Yes, I was going to mention that. I really appreciate that we're able to use the, the bid process and be able to support a local business. I do not so. agree with you anymore on that statement. So I was really excited to see that they had bidded and had submitted the bid and that it was more than doable for us. So. Great. All around, yes. You use a lot of short I. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm like win. <laughs> Bid. Bid. <laughs> Thanks, Sammy. Thank, thank you. you. And I, I just wanted when she, uh, when she was talking about the use of uh, extra funds on this, it just gives me an opportunity to thank Sammy and Paula for for really responsibly pushing us to handle those, uh, that influx of money uh, that we receive from the federal government in a way that, that um, doesn't encumber us over the long term. Mm -hmm. I think you've all been reading about some incidents on the other side of the state where a district is in $25 million uh, of layoffs and cuts that they have to do. And uh, I think how we've approached that hopefully will not put us anywhere near that. And you know, I know that We've built up our fund balance a little bit in doing so uh, because we've been able to uh, offset some general expense funds with the use of ESSER funds. Uh, just extends our, our ability to use those ESSER funds over a longer period of time. So uh, even though it, it appears that we're building uh, permanently a fund balance, we are not. You'll see that sp spending going down. Uh, you know, there's a lot of articles lately about this uh, federal, this ESSER funding cliff that districts will be experiencing, and, and there, are, there are probably almost a, a couple dozen school districts that are in, a, in an awkward position because they've committed to ongoing expenses from those funds. So again, we've been very careful, thanks uh, in, in great part to the business department, uh, um, you know, kind of reminding us of uh, taking care and how we s spend our dollars. So thank you for that. Another example of how fiscally responsible the district is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Is there a sense of urgency on this one? Uh, no, I don't. There isn't, but it, it doesn't matter to us either. Don't push it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> More things to say. <laughs> and our last discussion item is all marks about our NEOLA recommended policy revisions. Thank you, and these again are, uh, you've been getting a few policies over time. Uh, this continues the update to policies, and all of these are either a rescinded policy, but mostly on the 
technical correction side or to address changes in the law that have come into place since uh, we've adopted these policies. So they're all included there. There's, uh, what, five policies, uh, one being rescinded, some technical corrections to, uh, uh, to another, and then uh, the prevailing wage one is a new one, very specific to uh, so some legislation that was passed, as is the, uh, the language in the evaluation of the superintendent and uh, the religious patriotic ceremonies uh, and observances policy. Those are all uh, changes due to legislation that was, uh, that was changed. And we're following attorneys and Neola's recommendations to, to make those changes. And, and one was driven by a Supreme Court case. Yes, it was. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah very um, uh, high profile one. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions yeah. from Mark? Okay, we've reached the end of our agenda. And with that, thank you, everybody, and we are adjourned. Need self assessment, some monitoring reports, evaluation. Thank you. Johnny. Oh, thank you very much.